This is the second tape in a three-tape series entitled How to Hear God's Voice. This tape is specifically talking about how God speaks. And we've already covered, uh, the first tape was entitled God's Sheep Do Hear His Voice. And in that tape, I basically talked about how important it was, how beneficial it was to hear God's voice. Hopefully that would create, number one, a desire, and I made a real point of this, that as long as you can live without hearing God speak to you, you will. You have to seek with all of your heart. That is a prerequisite to really hearing and walking in a revelation of what God is saying to you. We also talked about how that God has already spoken to you, and he is constantly speaking to you if you are one of his sheep, if you are truly born again. So it's not a problem of God transmitting, it's a problem of us receiving. And so we need to put all of our effort into not begging God to speak, because that's already happening, but rather we need to fine-tune our hearing. And then I also talked about how that we have to have some downtime, or probably the better way of saying that is that you have to learn to listen. You can't hear God when you are so busy listening to everything else. If you always have a radio, a television on, if you are always doing something and you never spend time just being still, you'll miss the voice of God because God speaks in a still, small voice. Now, if you do all three of those things that we discussed in the first tape, I believe that you will begin to see an increase in your understanding and perception of God's voice to you. But there's still more to it than that, and that's what I want to deal with on this tape is to talk about how God speaks. This will help you to recognize God's voice. Now, I used a brief illustration in the first tape on this, but I really need to say this again, that God is already speaking to us. And it's not a matter of him not speaking. It's a matter of us not perceiving it. And to illustrate that, every one of us, every person listening to this tape, I'm sure, has done something And then after the fact, after you experience uh, failure, you go back and you say, you know, I didn't feel good about that. I knew I shouldn't have done this, and yet I went ahead and did it. And uh, then you say, boy, that was God speaking to me. And see, we miss it because God speaks to us in what many of us would consider to be a subtle way. In other words, it's not always obvious. It's not always clear. It's not a booming voice. I'm going to explain this more in just a moment. Let me give you an illustration, a specific illustration in my life uh, on this. One time when I was pastoring in Pritchett, Colorado, I had a situation where it was a small church. When I got there, there was only 12 people in the church. And then within a few months, it was running over 100 people in the church. There was only 144 people in the whole town. So it really was miraculous what we saw happen. We saw a man raised from the dead, and it just caused people to come out of the woodwork. And so it was good, but it caused problems. And the elders that were in that church, it was already an existing church when I came there, the elders that were there were custom combiners, which meant that they followed the wheat harvest from Texas all the way up into Wyoming. And so about six months out of the year, they were gone. And so because the church had increased, all of the elders were going to be gone soon on this wheat harvest. They decided that they needed another elder in the church who would not be gone, but would always be there, you know, to kind of oversee things and how they went. So anyway, I agreed to that. Well, the person that they picked to be the elder, uh, when I started praying about this person being the elder, I just didn't feel good about it. Now, there was no physical reason. This was an older person. I mean, I was in my 30s at the time, and he was in his 60s. So to me, it looked like he was ancient. You know, as I get closer to 60, that's really not that old. But uh, he looked like an older person at that time, had maturity. And actually, this man that they had chosen was uh, one of the very first that embraced my teaching. Most people, I really struggled when I first came to that church. But this guy had heard that type of teaching before he embraced me we went over to his house and he was friendly to us and there was just nothing that i knew in the natural that would have been a red flag to him being a elder but as i prayed about it i just didn't feel good i had a dread a fear about this guy becoming an elder but i didn't say anything because i didn't want to impugn his character i didn't know any reason 
And uh, but I just didn't feel good about it. So I waited a while, a week or two, put them off. I pray and I just couldn't come up with any logical reason not to go with this man being an elder. So therefore, I succumb to their pressure, to their choice. I had, of course, bucked them on a lot of things. And I thought, well, I don't have a physical reason not to go along with this. So I'll just, you know, indulge them on this. And so I agreed. We ordained this man as an elder. And then the uh, original elders left on their wheat harvest. Well, as soon as they were gone, this man's true colors showed, and I mean, he just came against me with a vengeance. He turned from a friend into an adversary. He accused me of stealing money from the church, which was ludicrous because I didn't even take a salary from the church. I took Zippo, Zero, Zilch, Nada from the church, and yet he accused me of stealing money. He accused me of committing adultery. He accused me of getting drunk. He accused me of lying. And I mean, he just, he was calling these elders and it just uh, sounded like I'd gone totally berserk. And anyway, it was a big problem. I wound up having to confront this guy uh, and facing him. And it was a fight and it was a problem. And, and anyway, my point in telling this story is that as soon as he showed his true colors, I knew in my heart why I didn't feel good about him becoming an elder. I knew that that was God who had spoken to me. And yet I wasn't sure that it was God. I had felt this reservation. I knew I shouldn't have done it. And yet I went ahead and just succumbed to logic instead of being led by my heart. And when that happened, I knew in hindsight that I had heard from God and that I had rejected God's voice. I just didn't recognize it. I heard it, but I didn't uh, discern it as being the voice of God. And when that happened, the consequences were so bad in my life. That was such a negative experience for me that I determined right then that from that time on, if I didn't feel right about doing something, if I didn't have a peace, if I had a turmoil in my heart, I wasn't going to do it, whether I was right or wrong. Maybe I didn't feel right for you know carnal reasons, not spiritual reasons, but whatever. I was going to wait until I resolved whatever conflict was on the inside of me before I went forward. And I learned a lesson, and that has served me well hundreds of times. Matter of fact, just yesterday, I was talking to my wife and the man who uh, runs our television ministry and produces it. And he not only does that, but he does these videos. We've just put out a video of a young girl that was healed, Nikki Oshinsky. And uh, that has touched tens of thousands of people. And Don Crow, one of my associates, we put out a video of his daughter, who was raised from the dead. And uh, this man in our television department is doing all of those things. And he is such a blessing, such a godsend. He fits. There's such a harmony. And um, I nearly missed hiring him. But I just knew in my heart that this other fellow I had interviewed, I had these reservations. I just didn't feel right about it. He looked good. He was recommended by one of the largest Christian ministries in the United States as being a great guy. And everything in the natural looked good, but I didn't feel right about it. And because of that, I just didn't move. I was not going to do something that I didn't feel right about. And uh, it was during that period of time that the man we now have, who has proven to be such a godsend, came across our path. And you know how that happened? I heard the voice of God just because this is how I felt on the inside. So this is what I'm wanting to communicate on this tape, is that God doesn't speak to us primarily in audible words, visions, dreams, and he doesn't speak to us from a third-person perspective. I'll explain that in just a minute. But rather, God speaks to us in our heart, in our spirit, and we just know things. We have an intuition, a feeling, a perception, a discernment, and that is the number one way that God communicates with us. Now, let me say that God can speak in an audible voice. There are examples of that in Scripture. God can speak in visions and in dreams. There are scriptural examples of that, and so I believe it. Now, I've never heard an audible voice from God. I've never had a vision. I've had, um, I don't know how to make a distinction here, but there are different types of visions. There are visions where people's eyes are open and they're seen. 
And uh, it may be their spiritual eyes that they're seeing with, but it's not a mental picture. It is something that they are physically seeing. They are seeing into the spiritual realm, and God is showing them something. That's what some people call an open vision. But then there is a different type of vision to where you just picture something in your mind. I've prayed for people before. And in my mind, I've seen their spine, and I've seen that like, you know, four or five vertebrae down, that there was one damaged, and I saw it. It wasn't something I saw with my eyes. It was just a mental picture. I've had that kind of a vision, but I've never had an open vision to where God just showed me something. But I do believe that there are people that have that happen, but I've never experienced it. And God has spoken to me through dreams. I've had some very dramatic times that God has spoken to me through dreams. But even though I've experienced dreams and this vision where it's just a mental picture, you know, those things are few and far between. I'd say that 95 to even more percent of the time, God speaks to me through my spirit in just perception, just things that I know. I discern something. All of a sudden, I know things. And I have come to believe that that is God speaking to me. I know that it is according to Scripture. And I believe it'll be the same for you. Sure, God speaks in an audible voice to some people, but that is rare. Even in Scripture, that is a rare way of God speaking. God can speak in an open vision. He can speak in a mental vision, and he can speak through dreams. But all of those things, even though I believe that they happen, that is not the dominant way of God speaking to us. The dominant way is just through God communicating with our spirit. In John chapter 4, verse 24, the scripture there says, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, this really isn't limited to talking about worship. Worship is communication with God, where you are giving your love and praising him. But as I've said often, prayer is not just a one-way communication. True prayer is communion. And true worship is communion. If you are truly worshiping God, it's not just a one-way communication where you are talking to him. But at the same time you are blessing him, God will bless you back, which all of that involves hearing the voice of the Lord. So I don't think it's inaccurate for me to say that if you are going to hear from God, you have to hear from him in spirit and in truth. I believe that that's the exact same principle. In other words, communication with God is comes through the Spirit. Now, this is a simple point, and it is so simple that I think some people might not really understand how important it is, but out of my experience, and this is the way I minister, I'm just telling you how I hear the voice of God, and I've heard some very dramatic things. I mean, God has saved my life. I I mentioned earlier about a plane crash that I missed because I heard the voice of God. God has given me direction. I flowed in the gifts of the Spirit before, called out people's names of people I've never seen. I tell people things that are wrong with them, that there's no way that I could know it. It has to be God speaking to me. I've experienced God's voice in a powerful way. And probably the most important thing I've learned about hearing God's voice is that he speaks to my spirit and not to my brain. It is not going to be, now it could be on occasion, but very rare occasions, it is not going to be God speaking in an audible voice that I hear with my physical ear. If that happens, you don't need any instruction on that. That's going to be so obvious that you can understand that. If you have a vision, an open vision, where you physically see something, and I mean lights and thunder and bolts of lightning, things like this, doesn't need a lot of explanation, you're going to understand that. But when God speaks to you subtly in your heart, this does need some explanation, and we have to learn to hear because it's a different way of hearing. It isn't going to come primarily in an audible voice to your physical ear. And here's another great point. God isn't going to speak to your brain directly. Now, I think that most people are expecting something like this. God is expe- Most people expect God to place a thought into your mind. And they are looking for God to communicate with your mind. And listen to this. If you can understand what I'm saying here, this will really help you. Most people are expecting God to talk to you like you are a second person. 
uh, here's the way I explain that is most people are expecting to hear God's voice in a third person perspective. In other words, they are expecting to hear God say, you go do this. Like say, if you're praying about a move and you're praying between moving to Dallas or Chicago, most people will say, God, which should I, where should I move to? And they are waiting to hear a voice or to have a thought that says, I want you to move to Dallas or I want you to move to Chicago. They're expecting that kind of a voice from God. That is not how God communicates to you. See, that would be God speaking to your mind. He would be a separate person speaking to you. But the way that God communicates with you is spirit to spirit. God is a spirit, John 4, 24, and those who worship him, commune with him, must do it in spirit and in truth. The vast majority of the things that you hear from God are going to come through your spirit, and your spirit is one with the Lord. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. The word for one there, the Greek word that was used is the Greek word hes, H-E-I-S, and it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. In other words, your spirit, your born-again spirit and God's spirit have become one. They aren't just one in principle, in purpose. It's not like they have similar purposes and similar desires, but they are one. Whatever is true of God's spirit is true of your born-again spirit. You have the mind of Christ in you, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. You know all things, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. There's no way you can understand that if you are just talking about your physical mind. This is talking about in your spirit, you have the mind of Christ. You know everything that God knows in your spirit. Now, I know that that's a radical statement. I do have a tape on all of that, and I deal with all of those kind of things. Uh, my four-tape album on spirit, soul, and body will deal with that. I've got a tape entitled Revelation Knowledge that will deal with that. I've got another tape entitled The Faith of God that deals with that same principle. So I won't take time to explain it. You can get those other materials. But your spirit is perfectly joined with the Holy Spirit so that there is a complete oneness there. And what I'm trying to express here is that when God speaks to you, he speaks to your spirit and he doesn't use, uh, I don't know if this is an accurate way to say it, but I'm going to say it this way just to try and get my point across. But God doesn't speak to your spirit in words. There is just a transfer of knowledge. There is a knowing, an understanding. Um, you just know things. You have an intuition. You perceive things in your spirit. And then your spirit has to relay that knowledge, that perception to your mind. And when your spirit, remember it's your born-again spirit, communicates with your mind, your physical mind, it won't say God said, but rather it will say, I think I am supposed to do this. I think that this is what God wants me to do. Now, see, that's a first-person communication instead of a third person. Instead of you hearing God speak to your brain, his spirit to your brain, where he says, you go do this, rather he will speak to your spirit, it will just perceive, it will know things, it will discern things, and then your spirit will communicate with you as you are seeking to hear, and you will have a thought that says, I think this is what God wants me to do. And that's your spirit who has been in communication with God, and that's the way that you'll hear it. Now that's, again, like I say, that's very simple, but that's profound. And see, because God comes to you and speaks to your spirit, and then you hear it as your thoughts, saying, this is what I want to do, this is what I think I should do. Because it is in that first person saying I, instead of third person, God saying you go do this, Many of us miss that as just being our own thoughts, and we don't discern it. Again, I refer to that example of all of us have done things that we didn't feel good about, and yet when we failed, when we ran into problems, we say, I knew I wasn't supposed to have done that. That was God speaking to me. But see, you missed it because it what didn't come in the third person. It was you, and you thought that was just you thinking this. You didn't know that it was God communicating with you. 
Let me use some other terms to try and express this. And I know that I may offend some people by even referring to these terms, but give me some grace. I'm just trying to get my point across, making sure that everybody understands this. But, you know, in the science fiction realm, if you've ever watched any of the Star Trek or, you know, all this sci-fi type stuff, and they have these telepaths that you just look at each other and they transfer information and thoughts telepathically. Uh, again, some people will take offense at this. They think all of that is demonic and stuff. I'm, I'm not here to advocate science fiction or any of that, but I'm saying that to a degree, I believe that that's the way it is in the spirit realm, that God communicates with you, and it's not words. It's not limited to words. His spirit communicates with your spirit, and I would not say it's telepathically, but it's it's that type of a thing where it's not communicated in words. It's just communion. It's just knowledge imparted. You just know things. Now, I am not endorsing New Age type stuff, uh, weirdness, and I pray that you'll understand what I'm trying to say. But I'm just saying that this is a way that communication with God comes. I could give you thousands of examples. I mean, right now, God has spoken to me. I seek him, and all of a sudden, I just know things in my heart. And I have come to uh, realize that I can trust that. Now, there does need to be some qualification put on this. It needs to be checked out by the Word of God. You're, you cannot just go on perceptions, on discernment, on what you are thinking in yourself if you don't know God's Word and if you aren't seeking God. On our third tape, that's what I'm going to be talking about, and I'll be giving so many balances to this that if you take the entire teaching... Uh, nobody will go out and just use this teaching as an excuse to do the first thing that comes into your brain and say, well, that was God telling me. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I'm not going to take time right here because I've got other points I want to make. I'll deal with that on the third tape. But if you are doing those things, if you know God's word, and if you can check and balance the things that you're saying is God speaking to you and compare it with God's word, and if it never violates, if it lines up with it, well, then, yes, you can do what you feel and what you perceive in your heart. And that's the way that God speaks to you. Now, that is very simple. But again, that's profound. I know that every person listening to this tape has had those feelings, those intuitions, perceptions, discernments. And many times in retrospect, you've seen that they were true. And you've also probably had discernments, perceptions, desires to do things that turned out not to be right. And you know that it wasn't God. And because of that, we just don't have any confidence. We think that that's nothing but ourself. But you know what? Your born again self just knows things. When you ask anything, God communicates with your spirit. And uh, in your spirit, you know all things. First John chapter 2, verse 20. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. You know what decision you should make. You know what God wants you to do. You know what your gifts and callings are. You know how to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Your Spirit already knows all of these things. It's a matter of taking the knowledge that God has communicated and put in your Spirit and getting it to where it's functional in your head. And again, many people miss that because they are waiting for a third person where God says, here's what I want you to do. That's not the way you're going to hear it. Your spirit is going to receive revelation from God, and then your spirit will communicate with your mind by saying, here's what I want to do, or here's what I believe God wants me to do. That thought will come to you, and it won't be originating from you. It'll be originating from your born-again spirit, and you have to have enough maturity to be able to distinguish between the two. Without me going into that whole teaching, that's what the third tape in this series is going to be about. Let me just say that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the scripture there says that the word of God is quick. That word means alive. It's living. Amen. God's word is not just a book. It's not like any other book. It's alive. It's God breathed. It's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now notice here, it says that the word of God will divide between soul and spirit and discern between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Discern what thoughts? 
thoughts that are of you and thoughts that are of God. And again, this is in a very subtle way showing you that the way God speaks to you is through these thoughts, impressions, feelings. And the only way you can truly discern which of these thoughts and feelings, impressions, discernments are from God is through knowing the word. The word of God is the only thing that can accurately divide between those things. So I'll be dealing with that more in the next series. Let's turn over to Psalms chapter 37, and let me use a scripture that has become one of the dominant uh, scriptures that I use uh, to discern God's will and God's leadership, actually to hear God's voice. In Psalms chapter 37, let me read a, a number of these verses here. In verse 1, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Man, those are some awesome scriptures. In verse 4 specifically, I wanted to direct your attention to this. It says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This verse is often misapplied, I believe, to where people say, Well, man, that's my scripture that whatever my desires are, God's going to give them to me. And so, you know, I really desire to get rid of this mate and, and get a new one. The one I've got's no good. And that's my desire, and I'm believing that God's given that to me. Well, that is not an accurate interpretation of this. This is not saying that God will give you whatever you lust for, whether it's right or wrong. On the contrary, in James chapter 4, I believe it's verse 2, it says, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you might consume it, Upon your own lust. The Lord there said that if you are asking for something that is not right, uh, you aren't going to, excuse me, that's James chapter 4 verse 3. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. God's not going to give you whatever you lust for. The way to interpret this verse in Psalms chapter 37 verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord. That's talking about seeking God with your whole heart. And when you do that, God will put his desires into your heart. In other words, he won't just give you whatever you want, but God will start putting his desires into your heart. He will change your wants. He will make your wants become his wants, or he will make his wants become your wants, whichever way you want to say that. God will change your desires. I've used this before in witnessing to people about becoming a Christian, and people have been convicted and known that they need to change, that they, they need to be born again. But I've actually had people come back and say, but you know what, there are some sins I just like, and I don't think I could quit. I don't think I can give it up. And uh, that's not really an accurate way of looking at it. God's not asking you to give up your sins. But anyway, in an effort to try and explain things to these people, I've said, but you're missing it. And I use this verse. That when you delight yourself in the Lord, when you choose the Lord as your Savior, when you make a commitment to Him, God will put His desires into your heart. He will change your heart so that the things that right now seem appealing to you and you know that they're ungodly. Like say, for instance, a person that was just into sexual sins and they like it. They, they enjoy sin, sexual sins, and they say, I don't think I could give it up. I'll tell them, but when you make a commitment, when you receive Jesus as your Lord, God changes your heart, and he will take those desires out, and he will put new desires on the inside of you. I've actually told people before that I commit all of the adultery I want to. I use profanity all I want to. I steal all I want to. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I don't do those things, but I'm saying the reason I don't do them is because I don't want to do them. God has changed my heart. I love God. And I love my wife, and I don't have any desire to commit adultery. Now, I'm not saying that a Christian can't have a problem in that area, but I'm saying that when you are delighting yourself in the Lord, when you are seeking God with all of your heart, he does change your heart. If a person is struggling with all of these sins, even if they're a Christian and born again, you can still struggle with desires that are ungodly 
be, but it's because you aren't really seeking God with all of your heart. When you seek God, when you get into his presence to where you are delighting in the Lord, this is implying that your emotional joy and peace, your benefit, all of your uh, satisfaction comes from the Lord. When you get into that realm, into that relationship, then you know what? God will change your heart so that if you were struggling with adultery before, if you would just get into the presence of God, understand the grace of God, that he still loves you even though you've committed adultery, and that God still will commune with you. And if you got into his presence, took full advantage of it, just got your heart stayed on the things of God, he'd take that lust out of your heart. That lust would leave and you would be set free. I know that there's probably people listening to this tape who disagree with that and you think, no, 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 you can't even have relationship with God. God won't have anything to do with you until you overcome all of your lustful thoughts and desires, etc. That's that's one of the reasons that people stay in bondage is because they try and get themselves cleaned up in order to have relationship with God. But it's exactly the opposite, really. You have to have relationship with God in order to get cleaned up. If you could clean yourself up and live a holy life without God infusing you with his life and power, well, then you wouldn't need God. The Lord wants you to come to him just like you are, messed up, whatever is wrong in your life, appropriate relationship with him by grace, through faith, not based on performance, on your holiness. And then as you get into his presence and start really feeling his pleasure, you will find out that these other desires and lust leave. You know, I just recently, uh, within the last week or so, I had a person uh, tell me that the, the way they got hold of my tapes was uh, some friends, these people gave my tapes to them, and he had been listening to my tapes for, I don't know, a long period of time. God had just touched his life dramatically. And the people who gave him these tapes, the way they heard me first, they were hearing me preach on these very things that you can have a relationship with God in spite of your performance, whether you are living morally right or not. And it's relationship that will break the grip of sin, not breaking the grip of sin that causes relationship. And they were actually on their way driving in a car to Las Vegas. They were high on dope, and they heard me saying these things. They realized the truth. God bore witness. Man, they just started immediately praising God and loving him. They threw their dope out the window, and uh, they got set free. They started getting in the presence of God. And you know what? They never had another desire for the dope. They got set free from it. And years later, this man who told me the story said he saw them in Bible school and they were studying to be ministers. God totally revolutionized their life through this concept that I'm talking about. So anyway, the point I'm getting at is that when you get into the presence of God and you don't have to be perfect to do this, but you just start loving him by faith and appropriating it, when you get to where you are delighting yourself in the Lord, God changes your heart. Your heart will change so that the desires of your heart will be God's desires. He will put his desires in your heart. And if all of this takes place, which this is a big if, and I want to just emphasize this once again, that a person could take what I'm saying and say, oh, man, so you're just saying that I can do what I desire to if you were delighting yourself in the Lord. But that's a big if. That takes some effort and some time. And you can't just, you know... If a person is out there living in rebellion towards God, if you're a God hater and somehow or another you've got this tape and you say, well, you know, my desire is really to be a dope pusher. I could make a lot of money and man, I'm going to go for it because I can, you know, he gives me the desires of my heart. Well, I can guarantee you if your desire is to be a dope pusher and uh, abuse people and and uh, use people like that, well, then you haven't delighted yourself in the Lord. That is not a God desire. I can say that based on Scripture and stuff. And so you just haven't been seeking the Lord. But if you would really seek the Lord and get to a place where your delight is in the Lord, then you can do what you desire to do. Radical concept. And again, this is so contrary to most people's thoughts. You know, basically, the majority, mainstream religion... Christian religion teaches that man is so corrupt and so pervert 
perverted, that whatever you want to do must not be God. If you really are passionate about it, it's not God. Now, some of you may think, well, I'm not sure they say it. Well, let me give an illustration. How many of you think that if you were to make an absolute commitment to the Lord, if you were to sing that song, I surrender all, wherever he leads, I will follow. If you just gave God carte blanche and you let him say, God, I'll do anything. How many of you are afraid he'd send you to a grass hut in the deserts of Africa or into some terrible situation or he will make you do something that you don't want to do? You know, most people have that concept. They are just certain that God's will is going to be opposite their will. And let me say this, that if you are a carnal Christian, well, then that's true. Matter of fact, the church that I grew up in, they used to have this statement that whatever you want to do, whatever your first choice is, do the exact opposite, and that's God. And some people laugh at that, but you know what? For a carnal Christian... If you aren't delighting yourself in God, if you aren't seeking God with your whole heart, that's really true. Romans chapter 8 says the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means it's the enemy of God, and it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Or you could say it this way, those that are in the flesh cannot have, do not have the right desires. Their desires are always opposite God. And so if you're only talking about Christians being carnal, well, then that would be a true statement that take your first choice and do the opposite and that it'd be God. But what that's missing is that you don't have to stay carnal. You don't have to be to where you are living in opposition to God. Your born again spirit has God's desires in it. And if you start walking in the spirit, if you delight yourself in the Lord, you will find out that those God desires start dominating and possessing you. And so if you're a carnal Christian, yes, you can't trust your feelings, your desires, your wants. But if you are a spiritual Christian that is seeking God with all of your heart, you can do what you desire to do. And brothers and sisters, I believe that this is the dominant way that God is going to give you direction is just through the desires of your heart. You know, I mentioned on the first tape that God spared my life one time when he told me not to get on a plane and that plane crashed and killed 169 people. Well, let me give you a little more detail on that. This was actually a trip to, I think it was Costa Rica. It's either Costa Rica or Guatemala. And I had been down there before. I had a wonderful time ministering in a Bible school, and I wanted to go back. They wanted me back. They asked me. So I set it up. I'd already purchased my tickets, had my reservations, everything. And this was about 1980, somewhere around there. And I was moving my mother from Arlington, Texas, up to Colorado Springs. She was going to work for me. And I had packed up a U-Haul truck and was driving it between Dallas, Fort Worth, and Colorado Springs. It was about a 17-hour trip at that time with the speed limits 55 miles an hour. And I started praying about this trip to Costa Rica. I had wanted to go. And yet when I prayed about it, all of a sudden, instead of a desire to go, I had a desire not to go. And it was even more than a desire not to go. It was a dread about going to Costa Rica. Now, the very first thing I did... See, I'm aware of this truth. I was aware of it then, that Psalms 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. So when I lost my desire to go immediately, that was a red flag. Immediately, that made me question whether I was really supposed to go. But it's possible that uh, it could be carnal things. It, it would it would have been possible that I was in the flesh, and the reason I didn't want to go down there is just because I was so tired of traveling. It could have been nothing but a physical, natural reason that wouldn't have been God speaking to me. So I don't take just any feeling, any impression, any desire, and just automatically go with it because I'm not that spiritual yet. There are times that I am not in the spirit. There are times that I am in the flesh. And so I have to evaluate whether it's really God or not, whether it's the spirit or whether it's carnal desires that are motivating me. So the way I dealt with that was when I... Didn't When I lost my desire to go to Costa Rica, like I said, I was driving this truck for 17 hours. 
I just started praying. I put on praise and worship tapes, started worshiping God. I focused all of my attention, my heart on God. I mean, I just drew close to God to where I was totally in his presence. My mind was totally fixed on God. I wasn't, uh, you know, concerned about how much I'd been traveling. Nothing else was bothering me. I was in the presence of God. I spent 17 hours praying in tongues and doing these things. And the more I got in communion with the Lord, the less I wanted to go to Costa Rica. And so based on that, that's it. I didn't have any reasons. I didn't know that anything was wrong. I didn't have, I wasn't mad at anybody. It, there was no reason it wasn't financial. There was no reason for me not to go except that I just lost my desire. Based on that, I called the people up in Costa Rica and told them I'm sorry, but I couldn't come. And they said, well, why not? And I didn't have an answer other than I just don't want to go. And you know what? That was misunderstood. I mean, no, they didn't get mad at me, but I'm sure that they weren't blessed by that. And I just had to have enough courage, enough boldness to believe that that was God speaking to me and saying, I'm not supposed to go. And I did it. And as I've already said, the plane that I was scheduled on uh, took off from Mexico City and it died and 169 people were killed and uh, every person on board was killed and the way God spoke to me in that situation was through the desires of my heart and I have used that hundreds thousands of times to discern God's will I know that when it was uh, time for me to uh, go on television one of the ways that I knew it was God's will was because of this very thing delighting myself in the Lord and he changed my desire Prior to uh, 1999, uh, let's see, it would have been 1998. Prior to that time, I had been on a lot of other people's television programs, and I had wonderful results. I was on uh, Jane Park's television broadcast. It was entitled Something Beautiful back about 1980. I did two days of programs with her. And she aired that, and on just one television station in Chicago, in two days time we had a thousand requests for my teaching on hardness of heart and that's how I got into the Chicago area and God has blessed it and I've known that eventually I would be on television because I saw the blessing of God on it the anointing of God on it I've had people try and get me to go on television I've had people that own television stations saying they'd give me free air time I've had people come to me and say that they were television personnel and that they were going to help me get on television. And, I mean, that's happened since 1980 until 1998, 18 years. I've known that I was going to be on television. And yet, I didn't have a desire to do it. I'd had zero desire. It was not where my heart was. And based on that, I didn't do it. It wouldn't have been right. And in 1998... I got to considering some things, and all of a sudden, my heart changed in one week's period of time. I was just seeking the Lord about, God, what's the next step? God, what are you? I felt like God was stirring me up to do something. And as I separated myself and began to listen, all of a sudden, I had such a desire to go on television. I got excited about it. I actually sat down and drew a rough sketch of what the set would look like. I knew the format that I would use, that I wouldn't be dressed in a three-piece suit and tie, that I'd just be sitting there talking to people. I, I mean, everything. It just all came together. And I came in one week's time from literally refusing to ever think about television until two, where I just was so excited about it, I couldn't hardly stand myself. Now, my desire changed. Well, when that happened, the first thing I did was, again, evaluate. Am I in the spirit or am I in the flesh? And the way I discern that is I just separate myself and go to seeking God. And as I get closer and more intimate with the Lord, if the desire intensifies, I believe it's coming from my spirit. If the desire wanes, then I believe it was my flesh. As I get into the presence of God, my flesh loses uh, authority over me. Any desires that aren't God diminish. But as I got into the presence of God, the desire got stronger. Well, you know what? This was such a big decision that I meditated on it for about two months, and I never even told my wife what I'd done. And then the Lord confirmed it to me at our minister's conference. Bob Nichols and Dave Duell, who are both on my board of directors, 
came to me independent of each other. It wasn't in a service. And they both told me that, boy, God spoke to them and told them that it was time for me to go on television. See, that was exactly what I had been feeling. And I had already accepted it as being God's will based on nothing but my desires. But it was such a big step that could have literally destroyed our ministry, the financial burden, that I just was waiting for some confirmation and God confirmed it. But the way he spoke to me was through my desires. And that's the way that it happens. And you know what? Every person listening to me has had this happen to you. Now, it may not be real pronounced in your life if you haven't really sought God with all of your heart and if you haven't gotten to a place where your delight is really in the Lord, to where he is the number one thing in your life. If you haven't reached that place, then this is not going to be prevalent in your life. But it can be by you just seeking God first and putting him first. But I know that there are a lot of people listening to this tape that honestly the Lord is the most important person in your life. You love him supremely. You're intimate with the Lord. And you are delighting yourself in the Lord. And there are all kinds of things that you want to do and yet you are holding back because you just aren't sure that it's God. You know, if you are delighting yourself in the Lord, then you ought to go with those desires of your heart. I have people come to me every year. Every time I go someplace, somebody will come up and say, man, I want to go to your Bible college. The very first time I heard you talk about it, I just knew I was supposed to be there. I have such a desire to do that and to get into ministry. And then I'll ask them, I'll say, well, have you signed up? Are you coming? Why aren't you there? And they'll say, well, I'm just not sure that it's God. And I've tried to uh, reason with people and talk to them. And finally, I've just adopted a stance of being kind of sarcastic about it. And what I've started saying to people is, well, you know, I think that's the devil. And they'll just be shocked. They'll look at me like, what? You're saying it's the devil for trying to get me to come to your Bible college? I say, yeah, that sounds like the devil. Sounds to me like the devil would want you to come sit under the Word of God four hours a day for two years and make this huge leap of faith and seek God with your whole heart and go into ministry and change other people's lives. That sounds like the devil. And, of course, I'm being sarcastic, and they get my point that the devil isn't going to lead you to make this step and come to Bible college. Now, I'm aware that not everybody's going to be coming to Bible college, but I'm saying those that have this overwhelming desire, why is it that we are so afraid that it's not God? We we have adopted this mindset that God wouldn't want us to do something that we want to do. If it's something that we hate and we feel like God told us to do that, then we'd say, man, that's God. I know it's God because I hate it. But see, that's not true. Some people are afraid that if they make a commitment to God that they're going to be a missionary, that God's going to put you in a poverty area. It'll be terrible with mosquitoes, rat infested or something, and you'll hate every moment of it. That's not true. That is not true. Most people believe that nobody would ever be sent to Hawaii. Nobody would ever be sent to one of these tropical islands to minister to those people. It's too nice. It's too enjoyable. God will only lead you to do things that you hate that are hard on your flesh. That's not true. And you know what? There are some people that certainly have to go to the bad places, that have to go to the places that aren't tourist attractions. But I can tell you that if you are delighting yourself in the Lord and if God wants you to go there, he will change your heart so that you'll love it. Some very good friends of mine, Bobby and Lynn Crow, are missionaries to Ciudad Victoria, Mexico. They're Americans, but they live in Mexico half for over 20 years. And I've been down there, and they have, God has blessed them. They have a wonderful place, wonderful house, wonderful compound and stuff. But there are hardships associated with living in a foreign country. There are things that they miss about America. And so there are some hardships, but I can truthfully say that God changed their hearts so that they love it. I've heard them say on more than one occasion that they can't even imagine living in the States on a regular basis. They can't imagine having to raise their kids in the United States. They love Mexico. It's because God called them there. And on the other hand, if a person was in a foreign country ministering and they hated every moment of it, but they were staying and through gritted teeth were preaching the gospel to these people, but they hated every moment of it, I would seriously doubt if they're called of God to do that. There's a joy and a peace that accompanies doing what God has called you to do. 
Not everybody likes what I do. But you know what? I love it because it's what God put in my heart. There was a period of time in my life where I was called to pastor, and I loved pastoring. I pastored three little churches. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. But then the Lord just supernaturally spoke to me and told me some things. Um, matter of fact, it all goes along with what I've been preaching right here. I had been uh, ministering in Childress, Texas. And uh, anyway, it's a long story, but it, God changed my desires. And because of that, I left and started a traveling ministry. And yet the very first independent service I ever held in Colorado Springs, the very first night I told my wife, Jamie, I said, man, this is what I was made to do. I love it. And I lost my desire for pastoring the church. And I, I love traveling. And that's one of the ways I know I'm doing what God called me to do. I have found in my life that every time God has a change for me, he will start changing the desires of my heart. Like the very first church I ever pastored was in uh, Seagoville, Texas. And for two years I stayed there, and it was a terrible time financially, hardship, persecution, rejection. We never had a large crowd. There was a lot of hardships, but I loved it. Other people told me, get out of there, shake the dust off of your feet, go somewhere else. But I couldn't because I loved it. Even though it was hard, I loved it. And one day as I was praying, I mean in about a week's period of time, I just lost my desire to be in that place. Things that had excited me about Seagoville, Texas, before all of a sudden I'd look at them and I just hated it. I thought, this is the dinkiest town I've ever seen. I didn't like anything about it. My desires changed in a week's time. I spent that entire week just seeking God. God, what's going on? Finally, the Lord told me he was moving me and gave me a date that I had to be out of my house. And I went home to tell my wife that God told me to leave, and here's the date that he told us to leave. When I got home, there was a for sale sign in the yard. We were renting the house. And I went in, and before, I didn't even get to tell Jamie anything. She came to me, and she says, the owners came by. They're selling the house. We have to be out of the house by such and such date. It was the exact day that God had given me. I heard from God. And you know how I did it? Through the desires in my heart. He changed my desires. You know, if you are in a job that all of a sudden you just hate, you need to evaluate. Do you hate that job because you hate your boss, because you hate your co-workers? Is it because you are envious of somebody else? Those are all carnal reasons. And if it's those things, well, then you need to walk in love, forgive people, and a lot of other things. But if the reason your desire has changed is because God has, you are seeking God and God has changed you, that's the way that he gets you ready to move on. If you were so in love with where you are right at this moment that you know, you wouldn't even entertain a thought, a feeling, an impression from God if it went against what you really wanted to do. And so if you're seeking God, God will first of all take your desires and change them. And then you will start, you'll be hungry and looking for God. What is it? What's happening? And that's when the Lord will show you the next step. I'm sure that there's people listening to me right now that you have a hunger in your heart to do something. You have a desire to do something. You just want to make your life count. You want to do something. Be bold. Take a step. And yet many of you are just paralyzed wondering, is it God? Well, you can find out real clearly by just taking a week off. Take a week of vacation. Some of you think, oh, well, I'd never do that. Well, then you aren't really delighting yourself in the Lord. I'm not saying that God wants you to miss your vacation, but I'm saying that if you really feel passionate about something, if you desire it hard enough, it's worth a week's worth of vacation or whatever to just get aside, do nothing but fast and pray and put your mind on the Lord. Seek him with your whole heart. And if as you get into the presence of God more and more and more in tune with God, if the desire increases, then do it and take that as being God's voice. If the desire decreases, the closer to the Lord you get, well, then it was just yourself. It was just there was some carnal reason for those desires to change. And you can follow the desires of your heart if you are delighting yourself in the Lord with all of your heart. Let me give one last um, word of warning or qualification or wisdom about this is that if you're brand new in this, and say, for instance, the thing that's the desire of your heart 
is going to cause you to lose a good job, to offend your family. Uh, it, you know, if there's going to be big, huge consequences, well, then I wouldn't just jump off into the deep without spending a lot of time checking this out. Or what I would suggest is that you start proving God's voice in smaller things and work up to it. In other words, don't just quit a job, lose all of your retirement one week before you're set to retire because you have a desire to do something, and then you find out that you missed God and you lost $100,000 or something. Now, if God told you to do that, uh, I'd do it. But I'm saying if you aren't sure, if you're young in discerning the voice of the Lord and doing these things, well, then just take baby steps and hear God in something small. Or if you're in a position where you've got to make a decision and you're trying to implement and apply the things that we're talking about here and you just aren't sure, well, then I would go to a person who is, who you really respect and you believe does hear the voice of God. You have some evidence of it in their life. And I would submit what you're feeling and what your desires are to them and ask for their wisdom and discernment. God can speak through other people. As a matter of fact, I'm convinced that there's people who are listening to this tape who you've been asking God for things, and the Lord is speaking to you through this message and showing you some things. And God can use other people. And uh, it's not that he's not speaking to you, but maybe it's going to be a year or two down the road before you develop your hearing well enough to be able to be confident and step out and do this thing. But if you're in a situation where you've got to make a decision soon, well, then go to someone you respect and submit to them and weigh what they say. Don't go by their word only because people can make mistakes just as you can make mistakes. But take that into account. When I prophesied to a person, I would never take a prophecy as the sole way of God speaking to me. If somebody prophesies something to me, it has to agree with something I've already felt in my heart. It's a confirmation. It is never the sole witness for anything. That is another bad mistake that's made by charismatics, is that they just take a prophecy and jump off and do something and uh, many times make bad mistakes. I've seen people receive a prophecy about that they're supposed to marry this certain person, and they don't love them. They don't desire that person. They have zero desire, and yet they go ahead and follow through and have a terrible experience. Now, that's just stupid. You know what? I would never let somebody prophesy to me that I'm supposed to marry a person, do something major, and just act on that alone. It would have to confirm, bear witness with what was already in my heart. Now, there have been a couple of times where something was kind of new to me, but once I heard the prophecy, I thought, you know what, that's really what I've been desiring. That's what God's been trying to speak to me, and I just hadn't realized it, and I'll go back and check it out. And I still check everything out. But basically, a prophecy confirms what has already been spoken in your heart, and the dominant way that God is going to lead you and speak to you is just through your own desires. He will put his desires in your heart. Now, again, this has to be qualified by you have to be delighting yourself in the Lord, which means that he is your soul satisfaction. He is the most important thing in your life. The scripture says that the heart knows his own bitterness. And what I, the way I interpret that is to say that you know whether you're really seeking God with all of your heart. You know whether you're just seeking God sometimes when you're in desperate situations. You know whether this is just the reason you're insistent on seeking God and hearing his voice is just because you've got a problem and you want to get over it, but you haven't really committed yourself lock, stock, and barrel to the Lord. He's not Lord. If that's so, this won't work for you. And I know that there's probably some people saying, well, I'm not there, so tell me how it'll work for me if I'm not seeking God with my whole heart. I don't want to tell you. I think it would be terrible for you to somehow or another bypass the system that God put in place and get to where God is just like a slot machine that you put your little token in there and pull the handle and his answer comes out. That would destroy you. That's not good for you. That's not the way that God wants it to be. You know what? If you aren't seeking God with your whole heart, then you aren't going to hear God clearly. You're going to be one of those that lets circumstances, situations, other people, things, outside influences dominate you. You're going to be a person that you're going to let failure be one of the guiding factors in your life. Pressure 
you'll do the thing that gives the least pressure in your life and stuff. That's actually a bad way to discern the leadership and the guidance of the Lord. Now, you can discern the Lord's leadership through some of those things, but that's not near as good as just hearing his voice. If you really want to hear his voice, there isn't really any shortcut. You need to be delighting yourself in the Lord to where God is your satisfaction. He pleases you more than anything else. You spend time, quantity and quality time with him. And when you do that, your heart will just change. You will start desiring things that you've never desired before. And you'll find out that these are godly desires. When your desires are selfish, you can't trust them. When your desires are unselfish, that's God. God's the only one that puts a desire in your heart to lay down your life for another person and and love them and bless them and help them. The devil doesn't give those kind of things. The devil doesn't imitate God like that. He's anti-God. He's anti-love. He's anti-other people. It's always selfish. You can discern whether those desires are of God or not by that. In our next tape, we're going to talk about how you can take the Word of God and evaluate all of these desires, intuitions, feelings, premonitions, perceptions. Uh, You can discern those by the Word of God, and God will speak to you through the Word. And that is really going to help you. As a matter of fact, I really need to encourage you that if you don't just take this tape by itself, but please uh, listen to the next tape in the series so that you get the full impact or um, you could make some mistakes here that could be critical. So please listen to the next tape as we start talking about that God's word is the ultimate test.